Welcome to another lively edition, folks, of The Deadly Experiment. I'm your host and producer, Rick Adams, and uh, we are continuing in our biblical studies, I think as never before on this program, The Deadly Experiment, taking deadly aim at the enemies of our people, the enemies of our nation, most of all the enemies of our God, who gave us all that we have, the liberty we have, the truth that we have, the freedom that we have to preach his gospel. Because without it, there's nothing else. It is absolutely forbidden to even think of a world that does not exist without the Creator. Because that's what science does. You know, we were just talking about that off air. Science, or what passes for science today, pseudoscience I call it, is um, really a particular maze of confusion and that's what it's meant to be. Theories and suppositions and various uh, hypotheses, but not always a conclusion that is logical, scientific, or in the end correct. It is not. Because we have to understand that today, as never before, we are living in the post-rationalist era, folks. The age of reason, if you will. When all real reason has gone out the window. And that's why we have a society, a state, a region, a nation that's turned upside down. Upside down, inside out, backwards, and totally on its head. Topsy-turvy, we say. And this is because we have rejected the Creator. No, we, we pay lip service to Him, you know, with our mouths, as we are told in the Scripture. They honor me with their lips, but not with their hearts, you know? And that's what rolling Easter eggs is all about, and that's what Christmas ornamentation is all about, and that's what saying God bless you when somebody sneezes is all about. But living the Word of God, acting on the Word of God, is what all of us need to do. Otherwise, in the end, what is there? Death. And death is the end for people in their world. And it is the end for now. Because in the scriptures, we're told death of the body is not a death of the soul. The soul is created by God to inhabit a body in this particular age that we live in. We call it the second earth age. And in the Gospel of Peter, well actually Second Peter, the epistle, chapter 3 and verses 1 onward, we read about an age that was before this age. That's right. This age is not the beginning of the earth. Many pastors and teachers would have you believe that. And they would have you believe that this is the here and now, and then we have the millennium, the rule of Christ for a thousand years, and then we go right into the eternity. Well, that's not quite true, because the Bible does speak to us. Right in Genesis, start in Genesis 1, 1, and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in the next verse, this is where the pastors and teachers mislead you and do not give you the accurate translation from the original Masoretic scripts, the Hebrew and the Greek. And the earth became void, not was void, became void, because something happened. And what was it that happened? It was what is called in the Greek the catabol. It's the overthrow. That's the overthrow of the first earth and heaven age when Satan actually fell and rebelled against God. And what did he do? He was able to garner forth about a third of all the angels that followed after him. Those were created by God, all the angels, Lucifer himself, Satan himself, the bright and morning star was God's creation. But Satan changed. Satan became very puffed up in himself, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 28. We're told in those verses that Satan was made perfect. He was made to be a, a, a cherubim who guarded the mercy seat, the seat that God Christ himself would sit on in judgment in the end, because rather than just guard that seat, he wanted to own the seat. You understand? He wanted to possess it for himself. Satan wanted to play God. And in the end times that we're in now, 
we're beginning to understand that there's going to come, before the real Jesus comes, there is going to be a fake Jesus, the one who rebelled against God in the first age that was. The earth became void. God destroyed all of the living souls on it. Well, he didn't destroy the spiritual soul, but he destroyed all of the remains, all of the physical attributes that we saw in that first and heaven age. So we have the results of that. We have all of the the wonders of the world, so to speak. We have all of the craters on the planet, fault lines that were not in that first and heaven age where earthquakes happen now. We have uh, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, we have Yosemite. We have all of these marvels that we call marvels and eruption of volcanic activity as never before. These were the result of that rebellion in the first earth on heaven age. Dinosaurs, their bones, their skeletal remains are the proof (coughs) that obviously they went back to another era. No, they're not 14,000 years old or 10,000 or 6,000 or even 100,000. They could go back millions of years. We don't know. Am I teaching evolution? No. Am I teaching God's Word? Yes. Because there is no age on the earth itself. But God has created the earth with appearance of age. That's a difference, you see? So this earth and heaven age we're in now is the age of flesh. When man is born of a woman, a woman, a man and a woman with procreative abilities in order to reproduce, as God said, we shall replenish the earth. In the book of Genesis, God said to replenish it. And he created all life, all of the souls, all of the races that were created in that age before the eighth day creation. Now you say, what does that mean, the eighth day creation? Well, there were the six days in which God created the heavens and the earth and all that is and all human flesh in this age. A man, a woman procreating, producing children. And we've covered on other programs that other races could not possibly have come from two people in the Garden of Eden, Eden called Adam, which means a ruddy complexion to show blood in the face, and Eve, which means the mother of all who will live through Christ to come. They couldn't possibly have come. The black races, the oriental races, all of these races were created far before the new race of the eighth day creation called in chapter 2 of Genesis, the Adamic race. Now, God created all the races, as I said, in Genesis 1. And at the very end of Genesis, you'll see that God says, and it was good. So, God created all of these peoples, and he said that it was good. He was happy with his creation. You see, he loves all of his children. But on the eighth day, that is the day following the Sabbath, the day of rest, God took a man and a woman in the garden, put them in that garden. Now, they didn't come from an egg or process of evolution and somehow form their human bodies with genitalia, with eyes to see, ears to hear, a pumping heart to pump blood. That is impossible. Friends, if you believe in that and you believe in evolution, something from nothing, you will wait, as Khrushchev once said, Nikita Khrushchev, for a shrimp to whistle. (laughs) (laughs) That's how stupid our people are today who believe in chaotic random choice. But Satan wants us to believe that. He wants to cast doubt upon God, doesn't he? You bet he does. Because Satan is the author of what? Confusion in the mind. And that's where the war is today, folks, as never before. Satan wants your mind. He wants it all. He wants to control your soul. How can he do it? Through your body? Not necessarily by weakening the body, giving us over to poor nutritional habits, poor foods, vaccinations, inoculations, drugs, all kinds of of, uh, chemtrailing from the skies into the soil, the pollution of the waterways, the pollution of the aqueduct, pollution through fluoridation and chlorination. All of these things take their toll on the body, yes, but they do not constitute the mind. Satan wants your mind. And his children want your mind, too. You notice I said children? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, Satan has kitties on the earth. 
He procreated them in that very same garden where Eve was tempted by the serpent and Adam too. And both partook, meaning both had procreative activity with the serpent, otherwise known as in the Hebrew, Nokash. The Nokash is the enchanter. Satan didn't appear as a slippery, slimy little snake with a tongue coming out, although you'd probably think some politicians have. Well, he didn't. Folks, Satan appeared as the most beautiful, the most glittering being. And God said, of all the trees in the garden, you shall not partake or have sex with that tree. Now, there was no apple on that tree. The tree means existence of life, a being. That's what the word trees means. Tree of life, which is Christ. The tree of death, which is Satan. See, this perfect symmetry in the Word of God. It's a numerical book. It's a book of history, a book of science, and a book of prophecy. So you have to get to know it if you're going to survive what's to come, because the battle is right here in your mind. It's for your soul. Satan wants you to believe in him when he comes in Jerusalem, sitting there where he ought not, in the Holy Land. Yerushalayim means God's city of peace. Shalom, shalom, Yah is God. Is that too hard to understand in the Hebrew? There's no J in the uh, Hebrew alphabet, so we speak of God as Yahweh. Yahweh. I am that I am. That's who He is. No other gods before me. I am the God of gods and Lord of lords. Boy, did the Pharaoh find that out in Egypt when he made the ancient Hebrews, our forebears, the Israelite people of the Bible, to be slaves for him. And then in the end, he relented. He gave up after seeing that Moses' God is God and not Pharaoh's God. So today, we have the Pharaoh in Jerusalem today. It, what do I mean by that? Well, we have the same pharisaical system today, the head honcho, the king of kings, as Jesus, but he's not king. He's coming as king, and his name is going to be called what? Counselor, peacemaker, lover of all, Lucifer, the bright and morning star. He's going to look beautiful. He's going to perform miracles by snapping of his fingers, commanding weather to change. If you don't like the weather now, don't worry. He's going to make it good. And you're going to say, that's Jesus. That's the real Christ. But it ain't. He's the fake. Now, why is God doing all of this? Because in the very end, he wants to see who is going to be with him, Satan, and who's going to be with him, God. There are two choices. There's no middle ground. So let's understand that. The book of Genesis means the beginning, where everything came from. And if you don't understand that book of Genesis, you will not understand the rest of the Bible. Try to make it fit like the pieces of a puzzle. You've got a square peg here and a round hole that's smaller, and you're trying to make it fit, and you're pushing it and increasing it and trying to pop it in, but it won't fit. That's why people are confused today. That's why churches today are confused. That's why people can only quote a few verses from the Bible in these Bible-believing churches. But guess what? Ask them, who are the Kenites? Do you know who the Kenites are on the screen? Who are the Kenites? Does your pastor tell you? Does your priest tell you? I don't think so. But my pastor is a Bible teacher. But my pastor teaches the Hebrew and the original language. He teaches the Greek. He's a master of all these things. Do you know who the Kenites are? Huh? What did you say? Do you know who the Kenites are? Does your pastor know who the Kenites are? I'll have to go back and ask him. And invariably they say, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. He's making up words. Well, apparently the pastor is not teaching the whole Word of God. And I'm not, I'm not downing the pastor. I'm not condemning them. In the end, they have to face God. We all do for what we have done and not done. But getting His Word straight is the most important thing. Now, I'm going to focus on those people today. The, I call them, because the Scriptures call them the Kenites. Everyone else calls them Jews, calls them 
Judah, as if they are part of the 12 original tribes, which they are not, as we show on other programs, on this network, on public access television, and on our YouTube channel, The Deadly Experiment. See for yourself. We're going to concentrate on who these sons of Cain are, who call themselves Judah. And but in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus says, I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Judah and are not, but do lie and are of the synagogue of what? Of who? Satan. So somebody is impostering somebody else. Somebody is saying they're God's children and they're not. And God's children the Adamic, Caucasian, Israelite, Jacobite people of the Bible in Europe, New Zealand, America, Australia, all of these countries, Iceland particularly, these are the people who are saying they are God's chosen people, and they don't know who they are, those who are God's people of true Israel. The word Manasseh, Manasseh is one of the 12 children Manasseh, the tribe of Joseph, his children Ephraim and Manasseh. Do you know what the word Manasseh means, the son Manasseh? It means forgetful. They forget who they are. They forget who they were, who they came from. But God has done that purposefully because he doesn't want them to know enough. If they're not protected by the Holy Spirit and the seals, that are spoken of in Revelation. The seventh seal is the seal in the mind that God's children, his called, his elect in this age, cannot be deceived by Satan and his children and their lies. The seal. In other words, it's waterproof. Can't get water in the brain like Roosevelt. <laughs> you see, you can't be deceived. But the rest of the world is going to be deceived. And God's people, the Adamic, Caucasian, Israelite, Germanic, Scandinavian people of the Bible, they are deceived now. They are fully deceived into worshiping those who call themselves Judah. Jews, which is a bastardization of the word. Not in the Bible. You'll not find the word Jews in the original manuscript. But Judah you will find. You will find Judean. So who's kidding whom? Now let's see who these people are and what they do in the Middle East, who call themselves Judah, and whom President Trump says are God's chosen people. Let's see exactly what they stand for, what they do, who they are, and how they get away with what they get away with. Let's take a sample right now. These two videos that I've produced for you that I have shared from others who are friends and partakers of this message on the internet have produced two short videos together. You watch and you'll see why many people are beginning to understand these messages. There's a mosque in Christ Church and 50 died so far. Brett and Tarrant, we're told, committed a white crime. There was a mosque in Israel's West Bank too, which saw 29 dead. Baruch Goldstein, we weren't told, committed a Jewish crime. There's not a single synagogue in Gaza Strip, and some 3,000 lost their lives from Netanyahu's murderous bombs over the years. And in El Salvador, where many churches stand, 75,000 were mowed down by Elliot Abrams' mercenary death squads. If guns kill and don't make a lot of sense... Automatic weapons don't make a lot of sense and access to firearms by dangerous folks should be choked. We'll be pushing our Republican colleagues to pass legislation that allows for protective orders to temporarily disarm individuals who have shown credible signs of being harmed. Then lethal weapons of state aggression don't make a lot of sense either. And access to military apparatus by madmen in high places must also be choked. Breton Tarrant, Baruch Goldstein, White Crimes, Jewish Terror. Benjamin Netanyahu, Elliot Abrams, War Crimes, State Terror. White Supremacy, Zionist Arrangement, Manifesto Lines, Regime Changement, it's all the same. Guns load, bombs explode. If you're not with us, you're against us. 
A few weeks ago, on January 23rd, Venezuela's National Assembly invoked the Venezuelan Constitution to declare the president of the National Assembly, Juan Guaido, as the country's legitimate leader. In one of his first acts, President Guaido invoked the same constitutional article that Oscar carried through the skies to notify the world that Maduro was illegitimate. Within 30 minutes, the United States was proud to be the first nation in the world to recognize President Guaido. Wait a minute. If USA is the mantra for Juan Guaido, then like Pinochet, Guaido's a puppet of U.S. imperialism. And by the way, John Bolton is here. Where is John? Working hard. Like I said, military apparatus in the hands of madmen in high places must be choked. Today, more than 50 countries around the world now recognize the rightful government of Venezuela. And the Venezuelan people have spoken, and the world has heard their beautiful voice. They are turning the page on socialism, turning the page on dictatorship. And there will be no going back. That's scary. Brent and Tarrant also had a manifesto ready to go before he filmed his bloodbath show. He made up his mind. There was no going back. Baruch Goldstein had a manifesto too. Palestine for Jews, ethnically cleansed, and redemption would ensue. The killing fields are just a click away. The Charno House pageantry is live streamed onto your viewing screen. You can turn off the TV, but the massacres are on track. Like Trump says, there will be no going back. I've seen the results of the bombing of hospitals, of schools, of uh, sewage treatment plants. It is appalling. And if you want to know what the people of Palestine, you say that you're speaking on behalf of the people of Palestine. If you want to know what the people of Palestine want, ask the Palestinian farmers. We've seen the most desperate and brutal violations of people's right to protest against injustice, against occupation, against the taking of the very ground from under people. Israel is an apartheid state. Any of us who have been there know that. Once you know that, it changes you. Though these settlements are repeatedly condemned as illegal by the EU, UN and Irish government, they continue to extract valuable natural resources and agricultural produce. These goods are then exported and sold on shelves around the world, including in Ireland, to pay for occupation. There is a clear hypocrisy here. How can we condemn the settlements as illegal, as theft of land and resources, but then happily buy the proceeds of this crime? We must be clear on this. Israeli settlements in the West Bank are war crimes. This is what we're dealing with, and I'm amazed at how relaxed people can be about it, as if trading in the proceeds of war crimes is not a big deal. I witnessed with my own eyes the crushing indignity of a Palestinian community cut off from their water supply so that it could be diverted instead to support an Israeli chicken farm. That is horrendous, and the injustice of it will stay with me forever. That commercial settlement built on stolen land beyond international recognised borders is a war crime and I know I'm repeating myself today and I'm asking my colleagues across the House today, is the moral response to simply condemn this as illegal but then ask how much for the eggs? Is there not a deep hypocrisy in that position? For a country that prides itself on upholding humanitarian principles and international law, this is unacceptable and I believe it's time we stood clearly against this injustice. We are doing commerce 
with people who are committing war crimes. And I believe that this bill from Senator Francis Black is where we get a chance to break the consensus that has utterly failed the Palestinian people. The case for this bill has become even more compelling, if I may say so, because we've seen appalling atrocities, uh, killing of, of Palestinian civilians. I raised 55,000 euros uh, to put in solar energy and water treatment plants, and I saw them being demolished, bombed by the Israelis. That's what happens. There is something rotten in the way democracy is defined and lived, and most importantly, denied. The relentless expansion of Israeli settlements on Palestinian territory is unjust, provocative and undermines the credibility of Israelis' commitment to a peaceful solution to a conflict to which we all want an end. Nelson Mandela came to a joint sitting of these houses in the early 1990s and he said, he said what made the practical difference uh, on behalf of the Irish people was definitive action from the people, was a boycott, was solidarity and that can make the difference here. The government of um, um, Benjamin uh, Net Netanyahu has to get a message and uh, I believe the message has to be a very simple one and that is respect the rule of international law. Well, folks, that shows you who is who in the Middle East, who is occupying Jerusalem today and why. Folks, Satan has to come to Jerusalem. Why? To pose as Jesus. Why? Because he wants Yerushalayim, God's city of peace for himself. He wants to sit on that mercy seat. And that's why there's all this squabbling about Temple Mount right now. You're seeing the buildup to the temple having to take over the land of Alamask, okay, of Alaska. That is the Dome of the Rock, which is currently under Arabic control. Now that has to change. We're going to see some very powerful events take place in the very near future. When? I don't know. But it's coming in the very end. And we're going to see that temple in Jerusalem. Temple Mount with the sacrifices are already being prepared, the animal sacrifices, and the again, the, the uh, synagogue of Satan taking control of the worship of that temple. And the world, when Satan comes, will believe him. All the religions will come together and say, that's my God, the Muslims will say. The Shintos will say, that's my God. And the Hindus will say it. And of course, the Kenites will say it because it is is there a God, Satan? Okay? You get it now? It makes sense. Are your pastors teaching you? Who are the Kenites? The children of Cain. And what did Cain do? He murdered his brother Abel. And Jesus tells us in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 17 and 18, and in that seed line, in her, was found the blood of all those shed upon the earth, from righteous Abel to Zechariah the prophet. Zechariah was slain between the altar or the porch and the temple. Now you understand why Palestine is being exterminated before your very eyes, and you are silent. Judgment Day is coming, folks. Thank you for watching The Deadly Experiment. Rick Adams saying, until the next program, may Yahweh bless his elect.